On the question, did God really command genocide, a question that many people see as the most significant question, ethically speaking, of uh, all the ones in the Old Testament, uh, perhaps a few things would be helpful to keep in mind. Uh, one is that if there is a good, just God who is all-wise, who issues this command, then he would have a morally sufficient reason for doing so. If you treat Israel like any other nation, and therefore that there is no God behind the picture, then of course that is going to change the picture entirely. But if you allow for there to be a God who is just, who issues this command, then again he would have a morally sufficient reason for doing so. Keep in mind too that the people who are at issue, namely the Canaanites, are engaged in all manner of activities that would be considered criminal acts in any sort of civilized society, incest, bestiality, ritual prostitution, uh, also the sacrifice of infants. Uh, these are again barbaric acts. So it's not as though they're just people who are wearing tattoos or eating shrimp, unlike the Israelites. Also, as you look at this picture, uh, you need to keep in mind that God waited patiently 500 years, including 430 years, in the land of Egypt, God waited until, as Genesis 15 says, the sin of the Amorites would be filled up. So it wasn't anything precipitous. It was measured. It was waiting until the time was right and ripe for judgment. Also, when we read about these sorts of commands, utterly destroy, leave alive, nothing that breathes, when you look carefully at these, you see that that language is typical of ancient Near Eastern warfare texts, and it is also used in very hyperbolic senses. That when you are looking at these ancient Near Eastern war texts of Egypt and Assyria and Moab and so forth, they use exaggerated language of utterly destroying, of leaving alive nothing that breathes, but we know from history that the sorts of things that are being described actually didn't take place nearly to any extent uh, that, are, that are typically being described here. So when, when we read about Ramses II in his battle at Kadesh with Syria, the language of utter destruction, of there being no survivors left and so forth, uh, that again is, uh, is far from being the case. It was actually almost like a stalemate a battle, but yet that language of, uh, of was, being, uh, was being utilized of, of, of uh, annihilation. Uh, so, so, and when we read the scriptures, we see the same sort of thing that there is language of utter destruction, but then we'll see in the same chapters or even within the same verses uh, th that there are actually plenty of survivors, that the language of utter destruction isn't taken as being utter destruction as many people think. So when we're reading the texts, we ought to look, first of all, uh, when we see utter destruction, look uh, a few verses later, a few chapters later, or before the end of the book, like in 1 Samuel 15 and then 27 and 30, where you see those who have been utterly destroyed are back at it again. There they are. They haven't actually been utterly destroyed. So uh, even God himself in Je Jeremiah 25, 6, 25, 9 through 11 says that he is going to utterly destroy Judah and leave its cities in everlasting desolation. But that, la that language, though used, uh, when we read, the, read at the end of the book, it is, simply isn't the case that God has done that. What we read about is that the nation of Judah has been utterly disabled religiously, politically, uh, militarily, economically, and so forth. Uh, but again, the nation continues to, uh, to go on well beyond that. So these are a few considerations that are worth contemplating as we look at the kind of language that is being used. Again, I have very little time to describe all these things and to go into more detail. Uh, but I would urge you to take a look at the book, Did God Really Command Genocide? And also, Did God, Is God a Moral Monster? Uh, for further details on these matters.